for Denison. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, this parliament presents an historic opportunity for poker machine reform, and it's vitally important we seize this opportunity and we put our support behind the government's package of reforms and the three bills before us now. Deputy Speaker, yes, the reforms on the table now are much less than what might have been, much less than the $1 maximum bets recommended by the Productivity Commission in 2010 and which I tried to secure immediately following the election also in 2010. And yes, much less than the rollout of mandatory pre-commitment, also recommended by the Productivity Commission in 2010 and which the Prime Minister agreed to personally but then walked away from in January this year. But, Deputy Speaker, despite all that, I do believe these bills have merit and are worth supporting. Worth supporting not because voluntary pre-commitment is much use, but rather because the bills make explicit in section 33 that the pre-commitment rolled out must be capable of disallowing unregistered play. In other words, Deputy Speaker, capable of mandatory pre-commitment at the flick of a switch, as the expression goes. And this is important, very important, because all it would take in the future is for a federal, state or territory government of good heart to flick that switch and, in doing so, finally to provide one of the most effective harm minimisation measures available. Deputy Speaker, these bills are also worth supporting because they will finally establish the precedent of federal intervention in poker machine regulation. And that's important because all of the states and territories, with the exception of Western Australia, have shown that they simply can't be trusted when it comes to regulating their poker machine industries and when it comes to implementing meaningful reforms to protect gamblers from the scourge of problem gambling. It seems, Deputy Speaker, that the rivers of fool's gold in poker machine taxation revenue are just too attractive for the states and territories, even though quality research out of Tasmania this year has shown that the cost to the community of problem gambling is as much as twice the tax collected. Now, I understand, Deputy Speaker, that the numbers are tight for these bills, in part because many of the members and parties in this place are every bit as conflicted as their state and territory colleagues. For instance, the opposition opposes the bills for political reasons, even though voluntary pre-commitment is in fact their policy. And any number of members throughout this place don't like these bills, and many members will indeed vote against them, because those members are effectively on the payroll of the pokies industry on account of the fat donations they've received already or have been promised. And in my opinion, Deputy Speaker, that's corruption. Not, of course, in the criminal sense, Deputy Speaker, but every bit as dodgy as bags full of cash changing hands in some corrupt developing country. Of course, politicians on the take are just a part of this story, because the real villains are the greedy poker machine barons who lie and bully to get their way determined to do almost whatever it takes to fleece the unfortunate and to protect their profits. Make no mistake, Deputy Speaker, we're not talking here about harmless recreation or quaint little businesses. No, we're often talking about big business, as illustrated by the fact the Productivity Commission found that in 2008-2009 some $11.9 billion dollars order. was lost. Uh, the member for Denison will resume his seat. The member for Moncrief on a point of order. Uh, point of order, Mr. Uh, speak, Mr Acting Speaker. I reflect on the comments made by the member for Denison. I believe they are offensive to me. He's implying uh, that I'm involved in, as his, use his word, corruption, and I ask he withdraw them. The member for Denison. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I have uh, been very careful not to level that accusation at any member, and I was very careful to say uh, corruption not in the criminal sense, uh, but every bit as dodgy, and that was the word I carefully chose, as the way cash changes hand in a developing country. I thank the member for Denison. Member for Denison. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Now we're often uh, so we're often talking about big business, as illustrated by the fact the Productivity Commission found that in 2008-2009 some $11.9 billion was lost on the pokies in this country. And how much of this was lost by problem gamblers, I ask? 
some $5 billion. Yes, that's right, some $5,000 million lost by problem gamblers in just one year. But yet the industry says that spending just a fraction of one year's loss spread across a number of years is unacceptable. And that, Speaker, is unadulterated hogwash. What about the people involved, I ask the industry? What about the 95,000 Australians with a poker machine gambling problem? What about the five to ten people affected by each one of those problem gamblers who push the number knocked around by poker machines into the million plus? What about the mums and dads, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters? What about the bosses, colleagues, friends? To the parties and members in this place who will oppose these bills, I ask, how on earth can you put money ahead of people? And I also ask, what do you say to the constituent who has spent eight years in jail on account of poker machine related crime? Or to the taxpayers who paid for it? Or to the hospital patients who went without timely treatment because the money that might have gone into health care went into the prison service instead? Or will the pokies industry donation to your next election campaign make it all worthwhile? What do you say to the constituent who has been spending the housekeeping money on her pokies addiction? and kept it secret from her partner, and who has now run up a $6,000 Aurora power bill and finally, after repeated warnings and four failed payment plans, had the power cut off? What will you say to the children if child protection takes them from their parents? Or again, are you okay with all that because the pokies industry election donation will take the edge off your sadness? To those who would vote against these bills, I, ask, I also ask, what do you say to the constituents whose employee had been stealing from the till for so long that their business failed and they were bankrupted? How do you reckon they felt when they lost their house? Or do you actually have no idea or interest? The more pressing issue for you being the concern that your local pokies venues learn quickly of your loyalty this week and donate handsomely to your re-election account. And finally, what do you say to the man who emailed me last year to tell me about his brother who lost the lot at Crown Casino again, and who then went upstairs to his free room, supplied because he was a good customer, only to kill himself because he couldn't handle the misery of his terrible pokies addiction any longer? Or would you say it was his own fault for not being responsible for his actions? Or perhaps you'd look concerned, wring your hands theatrically and mutter something about Crown being a responsible run venue employing a great many people. Maybe you're already a beneficiary of Crown's largesse, or not, and hoping like hell the casino empire notices, notices your loyalty this week. But just watch out, because you may all go to hell. In any case, don't turn around and say the pokies industry is doing a better job than it's given credit for and that it's committed to reform, because frankly, that'd be crap. For a moment at least, spare a thought for the witness who appeared before the Parliamentary Joint Select Committee on Gambling Reform this year and who recounted how she would frequented almost daily one of three pokies venues in South Australia during more than a decade of poker machine problem gambling, and who, and who never once, never once, was approached by a staff member about her gambling problem. In other words, all they ever cared about was her money. Bastards. And for the record, it was the New York Bar and Grill, the Flagstaff Hotel and the Tonsley Hotel. These are venues, Deputy Speaker, run by the same sort of characters who run Clubs New South Wales and Clubs Australia, and who threatened to sue me last year and who are yet to withdraw that threat. Well, I say to the poker machine industry, well may you continue to try and silence your opponents, but eventually the reformers will win. In fact, they are winning. Mark my words, those who fight for change will win, and the pages of history will justly condemn those who have stood in their way. Mind you, Deputy Speaker, there are already plenty of books full of stories about poker machines and the case against the current pokies industry, like the benchmark 2010 Productivity Commission report, which has been central to the political and public debate raging over poker machine reform these last two years. There's also the four reports, which have now been brought down by the Joint Select Committee on Gambling Reform. And again, I think the committee secretariat, and in particular, committee secretary Lynn Beverley, 
for their assistance progressing the issue of gambling reform in often controversial and difficult circumstances. Notable also is the recent study out of Victoria, which found problem gambling to be the second most prevalent cause of crime after drugs, and the 2008 study commissioned by the Tasmanian government, which found that employment in pubs actually fell after the introduction of poker machines, making a mockery of all the recent nonsense about poker machine reform being a job killer. Frankly, Deputy Speaker, there aren't many jobs in emptying machines of cash and turning the lights out for four hours or so a day, as is the case in many pokies venues. Or maybe it's the unpleasant job of cleaning the carpet and stools of the urine left by the problem gamblers desperate to stay at their machines, where all these jobs the industry keeps talking about are to be found. Deputy Speaker, I won't go on because by now I reckon everyone knows where I land on the need for poker machine reform and the fact that I will support the government's bills. But I would add that I will not support any significant further watering down of the reforms, and in particular I would not support any attempt to remove the crucial section 33 where the requirement is detailed that the pre-commitment to be rolled out must be mandatory ready. Those two paragraphs just nine lines, Deputy Speaker, are the heart of this reform and must be preserved. Deputy Speaker, it's obviously now up to the Parliament to decide this matter, and I can only hope there are uh, enough, <coughs> excuse me, there are uh, enough men and women of genuine goodwill to see these bills proceed. If not, if these bills are voted down, then this Parliament should stand condemned for failing the Australian community and for failing it very badly. But, Speaker, I don't think that will happen. I think instead that, despite the shortcomings of these reforms, we're actually about to see a moment this parliament can be proud of. In closing, Deputy Speaker, can I recognise, I think still present, no, unfortunately he's had to leave, he just had to leave, the Reverend, but I did wish to, I'll still recognise, uh, in my speech at least, the Reverend Tim Costello, who joined us for a short while and who leads the Church's Gambling Task Force and who has been a very strong voice for gambling reform. Uh, thank you to Tim. Uh, thank you to Tim for being here today for a short while and thank you for what you do to help some of the most disadvantaged and vulnerable people in the country. Thank you, Deputy Speaker.